first of all, congratulations, students. Uh, you have gone through one of the most difficult classes <laughs> you've ever had. And, uh, and you've had a tough last year and a half. Uh, 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 I, I, you know, I applaud your tenacity and your, your uh, willingness to be flexible. Welcome to public health. And uh, I, I, I'm real proud of all of the work that you've done. This has been a tough class. I also want to thank Dr. Tahara and Kural Matar. Uh, you know, the work that they put in, uh, it, it can't be measured, um, the amount of work they've put in. And uh, without Kural's help, uh, this would have been really tough for Dr. Tahara. Uh, you know, keep in mind also that a lot of this work is done uh, months prior. So uh, thank you. Uh, Denise and Corral for all of your uh, hard work with that. And I also want to uh, thank uh, George Contreras and uh, Ari Markinson. Uh, apparently they've, uh, they've been pretty valuable for the class as well. Dr. Tara, thanks for everything you've done with this group and uh, looking forward to the presentations. Thanks very much, Dr. Kittleson. So because this is a class, of course, I have to have a couple of things to say before we get started. Um, however, while I'm doing this, what I'd like to say is first of all, um, if there are alumni here, um, if you're HPM alumni, please just put it in the chat and tell us what your project was. If you are just alumni from the uh, School of Health Science and Practice, please just, um, we'd like to give you a shout out. Thank you all of you for coming. I know I saw a few names. I saw Patty Reynolds and Dawn French who happen to have been on the same project. So that's uh, for a few years back. So just quickly scanning. Um, and also um, Professor Markinson is on the call. So thanks very much. So I'm gonna just sort of walk you through what Capstone is. I'm going to just um, make a couple of comments and then I of course have a slideshow. Um, no class would be complete without one, right? So um, first I also wanna alert all of you that um, Wednesday and Thursday night, the other Capstones from the other programs are going to be via Zoom. So on Wednesday night, we have community, uh, we have health behavior and community health. And Thursday, we have both biostatistics and epidemiology capstones. So I hope you'll join us for those others. And a lot of us were already at the earlier one with environmental. So you've got a great week um, scheduled. So capstone is the culminary applied research experience for MPH students uh, before graduation. In capstone, students have the opportunity to really integrate and apply the knowledge and skills they acquired in the program to real-time public health challenges and community stakeholders. They also have the opportunity to hone other skills such as project management, public speaking, and systems analysis. They create concept maps, flowcharts, logic models, and ideate the projects and develop solutions. In health policy and management, the students have the opportunity to really look through the lens of the patient or the user's experience and follow their journey. And that's the lens that they use to address the public health challenges and work with community-based organizations. Although this semester they didn't have the opportunity to work with community-based organizations, all three capstone teams had the opportunity to work with stakeholders in the respective fields. Before the students um, present, I want to share with you a brief look at what our process was. The students used what we refer to as the force D strategic design approach to their research. This approach enables them to really not be constrained by traditional um, boundaries and barriers and also consider the impact on the demographics studied. It's a human centered design approach where they start with empathy. And this requires the students to zoom out to really understand the ecosystem and the stakeholders and the context, and then zoom in to really address the specific problem. So what's capstone? Gosh, a lot of people shake, shake, you know, scratch their heads. I assure you it's not free falling, although at times it probably felt that way. But in fact, capstone is the last stone that holds everything else in place. And um, for the students, it's really all of the knowledge that they acquired in this program. It's also an opportunity and of course process. No course with me would be complete without a flow, a flow chart. So I wanna briefly just sort of tell you a, a bit about what this process is, the 4D, which is called the human-centered design. So as you see, we have four, four stages, discover, define, design, deliver. You also see we have this divergent and convergent thinking. So the divergent thinking really is the place where we ideate. We sort of expand, explode, look at the market, Nothing, no ideas are, are, are looked over. And each time we go through the, the um, divergent part, we then come back together with convergent 
thinking. We think about how we either apply what we learn or how we're going to measure it or how we can think about and structure this. So this is really an iterative and a cyclical process. And the goal is to really help tell the story about the public health challenge that we are looking at. So the discover is where you study the context, the ecosystem, what's working, what's not, where's there an opportunity. Define is really where is what is out there and why it's working, where there are gaps, where there are insufficiencies, and how will we study this problem? Design is what do we learn, now what? Where are some of the infrastructure needs? What are some of the next steps, actions and innovations? So what's the purpose? Well, the purpose really is for us to develop creative leaders who can collaborate and innovate to solve real-time public health challenges. And what Capstone is not a shouting match or heavy lifting. Everybody participates equally. So where do we start? Obviously with public health and there are millions and millions of public health challenges for us to study. The students start with a problem statement and then develop a research question. They also use literature both through the computer and also those are books for those of you who don't recognize what they are. They work on team building and idea generation and they make connections to create a new narrative for the problem that they're studying. So they also conceptualize their project using whiteboard or whiteboard-like objects. Oh, sorry, that was Capstone 2021. COVID hit. So what does our process look like? From week to week, this became our reality or maybe even a little bit of Hollywood squares. What I'm showing you here is actually how we reset to collaborate in a virtual setting. We used a program called Miro, which is a collaboration tool. It's, a, it's basically a virtual whiteboard. What you see here is how the students um, actually worked on their projects. So this is one of three. Each student has their own infinite whiteboard. And what you see are they have various frames and various um, diagrams, drawings, photos, things, all things that they would be using in their program, on, in their project. The really cool thing about this is that they can work on it in real time. They can be on a Zoom call, they can be on a telephone call. They don't even need to be in the same room or they can work asynchronously. All of their comments, all of their changes are all recorded. And so when students jump back onto the whiteboard, they can actually um, see what messages were left to each other. I'm gonna just briefly show you a video. Let's hope this works. Just part of the video. Miro is a whiteboarding platform where your team can create, discuss, and share their work using the simplest tools. It fits right into your team's current workflow. They can add everything from spreadsheets to interactive prototypes to the board. And don't be afraid to run out of space. All you need to do is zoom out to see the big picture. To start a conversation, go to the collaboration toolbar in the bottom left. Suppose your colleague left a comment on the board. He wants your input on a visual for the project he's working on. So you can see that the students can really work together or independently, and they really had the opportunity to, um, to use this to replace being in person. They also put their posters together for each one of the three projects, and these will be available in the breakout rooms. Um, sorry. These will be available in the breakout rooms after our presentations. So I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank our first responders and our healthcare colleagues and all those who supported the students at home with their projects um, and enjoy the presentations. Um, last thing that I wanna do right now is I'd like to just thank the faculty for their support and hard work and supporting the students throughout the program. I especially wanna thank Professor Matar and Professor Contreras, happy birthday, by the way, and our chair, Mark Kittleson. Of course, behind the scenes, Cindy Jakubowski. Um, a shout out to Taylor Gerber, who prepared all the marketing communications and who was just selected as one of 10 fellows for the prestigious John Solomon Fellowship for Public Service. Go Taylor, go you, thank you. I also would like to give a shout out to Mike Carter and to Educational Media, especially Mike Frankfurter, who helps students with their visuals. And I'd also like to take a minute for us to remember our friend and educational media specialist, Christian Sheridan, who left us too early. Our condolences to his family and to his friends in educational media. 
Chris, you were definitely missed this capstone and you will be missed. Thanks for joining us. Now I will turn the program over to our students. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Our team is going to present on our capstone project, connecting New York State sourced nutrient rich food to vulnerable communities. My name is Deborah Abrams. Nicole Early. Dora Cook. Wamsi Krishnan Parvatareti. Ariana Polanco. Masuda Raman. Savnik Singh Chug. And Amanda Spence. Inefficiencies in the food supply chain in New York have resulted in several adverse outcomes. In 2017 to 2019, 10.8% of households were food insecure, meaning they did not have reliable access to enough affordable, nutritious food. In contrast, in 2019, 409,000 tons of surplus produce were generated. Also in 2019, there were 321,000 tons of produce that was left unharvested. Furthermore, from this unused food, 36,600 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent gases were generated. Based on our literature search, we found a disconnect with the supply side, which is the farmer, and the demand side, which is the food insecure households. Problem on the supply side manifest as farmers with unsold surplus food and unharvested crop going as waste, which they have to resort to send it to the landfill. And on the demand side, less food is being channeled to food insecure households. So the problem is how to connect the fresh produce from farm to food and secure household. We used a 4D study design to solve this problem in our project. Next slide. Having conducted preliminary research and identified several issues contributing to food insecurity within New York, we developed a visualization of the main factors causing food insecurity within the state. Those include social determinants of health, fresh produce farms, target populations, disruption in food chain, collaboration with disruptors like City Harvest, current practices, funding, and stakeholders. With this concept map, we determine which topics must be further researched in order to better understand the problem and develop solutions to connect New York State source nutrient-rich food to vulnerable communities. Our concept map and analysis later informed our research question and proposed solutions. Next slide. So prior to the pandemic, food surplus occurred because the logistics of farming were complex. Farmers overplant as a safety net to reduce economic risk to their crops, such as changes in the weather and pests. Consumer preferences also contribute to market demands for more favorable produce in size, shape, and season. Additionally, distributor restrictions that require a certain amount of tonnage to be produced limits the amount that small farms are able to sell, causing them to be left with excess. Furthermore, the perishability of certain foods causes farmers to overproduce in order to manage the risk. And finally, New York State farmers lack a centralized information hub that if were created, could aid in the streamlining and rerouting of food distribution. Next slide. So with our gain knowledge, an understanding of what causes food insecurity in New York and the reasons for farm food surplus prior to the pandemic, we developed the following research question. In what ways does food insecurity impact health disparities and how can access to greater amounts of healthy food reduce the disparities? Next. So based on the above research question, we did a relevant research review to better understand the opportunities to improve access to fresh produce to food insecure communities. So the Farm Act of 2018 informed a study of the barriers, incentives, and standard operating protocols. A literature search was conducted to review food insecurity's role as a major public health issue, and we used the database to determine the issue of food insecurity and its access. We also used it to examine the social determinants of health, chronic diet-related illnesses, to determine the surplus and the waste stage, how farms serve as a primary source of food, and the impact of COVID-19 on the supply chain. The United Nations Sustainable Developmental Goals and Healthy People 2030 guided our examination on capacities of small-scale farms and guided our study to provide equitable access to space, technology, and markets. The 10 essential public health services guided our examination to study the connection between food and health, the current supply chain for routing fresh produce to communities in need. And finally, a stakeholder interview was conducted in order to better understand how each part of the supply chain works from the stakeholder's point of view. There are several reasons for food insecurity. 
geographic location is a factor. Some areas are food deserts, which have limited access to affordable nutrient-rich food, while some areas are food swamps, where fast food and nutrient-poor food is plentiful. This map indicates where in New York City healthy food is accessible. Areas that are lacking such access include parts of Brooklyn and the Bronx. The COVID-19 pandemic disrupted the food supply chain and caused an increase in the numbers of food insecure households. Food insecurity is a function of environmental conditions which can influence the health of a population also known as the social determinants of health. Three key determinants of health which can impact the accessibility and affordability of food for a person or family include economic stability and income, whether housing in a community is affordable or costly and stable, and the structural environment, such as the distance between grocery stores and housing. Households who identify as low income and spend more than 30% of their income on housing are at a higher risk for being food insecure. Individuals who become food insecure are also at a greater risk for developing health issues and chronic diet-related diseases. Since diet is a modifiable risk factor for illnesses such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, it is important to focus on access to healthy foods in order to improve population health. It is estimated that 20 billion pounds of produce is not used annually. This visual highlights both the causes and effects of a food surplus. The most popular causes are food imperfections, crops that are not harvested, and a reduced workforce. The effects of a food surplus include a massive amount of waste, 229 million tons, or 35% of the U.S. food supply to be exact. Surplus food results in 4% of the nation's greenhouse gases, 15% of fresh water use, and 24% of landfill input. A food surplus also created harmful greenhouse gases that only further contribute to negatively impact climate change and global warming. Next slide, please. The COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the situation, resulting in higher numbers of food insecure households and greater amounts of food waste. Food supply chains were disrupted while grocery stores demonstrated increased demand for food. Research has shown New Yorkers, especially residents who never experienced challenges accessing food, exhibited higher rates of food insecurity since the start of the pandemic. Food insecurity in the U.S. tripled during March and April of 2020 to 38%. Nourish New York was created to help food insecure populations receive fresh produce while simultaneously aiding farmers in selling their crops during the COVID-19 pandemic. Luckily, Nourish New York will become a permanent program due to recent additional funding from the New York State Department of Agriculture. This will help those farmers and food insecure households still struggling. Next slide, please. Our entire research has pivoted us to the following four main key takeaways. First, food insecurity has been an ongoing issue for decades, and as mentioned before, it has been further intensified by the recent uh, times due to COVID-19. Minority communities continue to be hit the strongest due to the lack of financial support, systematic bar barriers set in place, as well as the uneven distribution of access to fresh foods within these communities. Second, social determinants of food insecurity further adds to the public health crisis of diet-related illnesses. Third, there is also a mismatch of supply and demand. There seems to be a big disconnect between the surplus of food available and the number of food insecure homes. We need to really reevaluate the system to reroute the additional supply of food to underserved communities. And lastly, food insecurity as a whole is going to be, a, is a larger issue and is something that cannot be fixed overnight. However, we do propose to initiate the following recommendations in order to begin the steps of connecting farmers to underserved communities. Next slide. A redistribution of fresh produce surplus from farms to food insecure households with a focus on low income households should not only reduce the meal gap, but also improve public health. Government food assistance programs are inadequate. About 1.6 million people in New York City alone receive SNAP benefits and financial assistance for food, which supplements their diet and increases food affordability. Yet this program still does not provide enough food for the average recipient to eat three nutrient rich meals a day. There are also many individuals who are unaware that they are SNAP eligible, therefore they're left out of the narrative. Our goal is to reroute fresh produce to consumers, so to minimize the missed opportunity of surplus or unharvested crops, therefore increasing access of healthy food to food insecure households. So to facilitate the food redistribution, we plan to create a centralized website as there is no single comprehensive portal 
that connects farmers, distributors, and the recipients. This website serves as an information portal where the farmers can communicate with intermediaries and exchange the information in order to provide each other with the opportunity for rerouting surplus food through different channels and reducing the food wastage. Next slide, please. And we plan to design a customized single sign-on app to facilitate farmers supplying their goods to food insecure communities. So the advantages of the app would be, it takes the burden of the farmers about finding different options. It provides a low cost option if this is remote work. And if this is successful, this will help reduce the waste. It enhances no contact delivery to reduce the spread of infection during COVID-19 phase. Food prescriptions offer the opportunity to broaden outreach and extend aid to those who are often marginalized, do not meet SNAP benefits criteria, or who lack the knowledge or access of food aid and health programs. Our proposal aims to combat chronic diseases as well. Food prescriptions work because healthcare providers have an easy way to identify vulnerable or food insecure patients through patient health screenings for food insecurity. There's no associated shame. It's a discreet method to receive the fresh food that one needs. It's funded by CMS reimbursement, the ACA, and, and the 2014 Farm Bill. Lastly, partnerships between providers and local food markets offer a realistic option in getting fresh produce to low income and vulnerable populations. This program offers the opportunity to educate participants and engage them in behavioral changes to establish healthy food practices, therefore promoting healthier communities. A third component of the solution we are proposing consists of a collaboration between New York City Health and Hospitals, Gotham Health Homecrest in Brooklyn, along with Grow NYC, a nonprofit focused on implementing farmers markets across New York City. This particular health facility was selected for a pilot study due to its location. Brooklyn had a high insecurity rate of 14.2% in the year of 2018. The clinic is within one of Brooklyn's low income census tracts, and Brooklyn has a high prevalence of diabetes and hypertension when compared to New York State as a whole. Through this partnership, we propose a pilot study where a farmer's market, similar to Grow NYC's Green Market program, will be co located with the clinic. SNAP benefits and food prescriptions will be accepted at the farmer's market and provide community members with an opportunity to access affordable produce. The market is sourced from New York State farmers, allowing farmers to receive a financial profit. We want to encourage healthcare providers to own food insecurity as a public health priority, which contributes to chronic diet-related illnesses. So to put our proposals together and develop this pilot initiative, we intend to use a PDSA or Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle process. Plan to develop the initiative, like having a central information hub connecting farmers to the SNAP programs, run a pilot in Brooklyn, engage healthcare providers to prescribe fresh food and increase access to fresh food. To do, to perform this initiative, we decided to create number one, a website or an app. Number two, have the healthcare providers from central Southern Brooklyn to write these food prescriptions and then have mobile food trucks to come to low income areas and increase access to food and food prescriptions. Study or analyze this by looking into the number of farmers participating in SNAP, number of food prescriptions written and filled, and what are the challenges to access? Act, adjust it to keep improving it by having a single sign-on app connecting farmers to more feeding networks, engage more healthcare providers all over Brooklyn now to participate and prescribe fresh food and increase buy-in from New York State and health insurances to support this initiative. Then we plan to scale up our project to cover the whole of New York City and then whole of New York State. Next. Funding and success of this overall program will be contingent on the following key performance indicators. Uh, we are hoping to see an increased amount of produce that is consistently being rerouted to underserved communities. Uh, we're hoping to see an increased number of households who have uh, access to fresh fruits and vegetables, increased number of patients who have controlled versus uncontrolled medical conditions specifically surrounding hypertension and diabetes, as well as the reduction in uh, emergency department usage associated with diet-related illnesses. And lastly, we're hoping to see an overall reduction in food waste. Last, on next slide. So the key takeaway from our project is our proposal would provide farmers with opportunities to connect with food intermediaries and reroute previously unsold, unharvested food that will potentially better connect the supply of food with the unmet need. And number two, reduce the food waste, which is good for our environment. Second, it will promote partnerships between healthcare providers who will now be more engaged and fresh food sources, obviously via intermediaries that can increase the access to healthy food resulting in healthier communities. Rerouting unsold food uh, will provide farmers with economic gains 
intermediaries with new supply lines and food insecure communities with greater access. We believe that this is not only a logical thing to do, but a moral obligation to improve population health. Next slide. And here are our references. Next slide. And here is the acknowledgement. We want to thank our mentors and our stakeholders. Next slide. And now we will play the video presentation we prepared on our project. New York produces nearly 3.9 million tons of food waste each year, which equals about the same as 26,000 blue whales, the largest mammals on the planet. Food waste contributes to about 18% of all waste in New York and produces the greenhouse gas methane. Meanwhile, in 2017 to 2019, nearly one out of every 10 households in New York were food insecure, particularly among minority communities within New York State particularly in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and parts of Manhattan. Food insecurity directly relates to the incidence of chronic diet-related illnesses, such as obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. The Farm Bill of 2014 intended to enhance SNAP so that participants can afford more fresh produce, the challenges such as proximity to farmer's markets, hours of operation, and structure barriers still exist. About 87% of all agricultural products sold are manufactured on family-owned farms. The COVID-19 pandemic has only magnified the disruption in food distribution. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, grocery store expenditures have increased by 15%, while food and drinking service expenditures decreased by 47% in the last 12 months. Farmers found themselves with a surplus of food without the ability to bring it to the market. Farm bankruptcies increased approximately 23% in the past 12 months, while food insecurity and hunger rose by 38%. Connecting New York State source nutrient-rich food to vulnerable communities must be our priority for healthcare providers and public health professionals in order to mitigate adverse health, economic, and environmental consequences. We aim to bridge the gaps in the supply chain by, one, providing an information hub via a website where farmers can connect with intermediaries and exchange information to provide each with an opportunity for business. A call to action for healthcare providers to adopt more food prescription programs to support patients with chronic diet-related diseases by providing them with a prescription that will increase access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Pay for by health insurance. And our last proposal is a mobile food market truck that will allow community members who live in the low income census tracts to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables at neutral locations, such as near public transportation hubs, places of worship, and potentially schools. Please join us in observing Stop Food Waste. Thank you. Thank you very much, team. 